Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Insight Seminar. Uh, my name's Dan Phillips. I'm one of the educators here. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which this event is taking place and pay respect to elders past, present and future. Uh, we're on stolen land and there's still so much more to be done. It's September 18th, so I'd also like to acknowledge Didi Ramon. It's his birthday. Thank you, Didi, for all the memories. And I'd also like to introduce our speaker today. I'm not sure if you're a Ramones fan, but we'll talk about that later. So um, uh, Chaps is here to talk to us about Queensland Opioid Stewardship Program. And I think it's a topic that will uh, have a lot of interest because of the, what we've seen with opioids recently with the high rate of hospital presentations as well as uh, the high overdose rate. I think it's a topic that many people would like to know more about. Uh, welcome, Champs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to present in this forum. Um, so my name is Champika Patalo. My background is uh, I'm a pharmacist. When I did clinical work, um, I was a cancer care bone marrow transplant pharmacist, and uh, more recently I've been working as a quality use of medicines pharmacist. Um, at the moment, I, I'm a um, health improvement fellow at uh, Clinical Excellence Queensland, and this program, the Queensland Opioid Stewardship Program, is actually um, sponsored uh, through the statewide um, emergency department uh, advisory panel. And just want to um, acknowledge their contribution to it. I want to keep this uh, semi-informal, if I may. Um, and so um, I thought I'll start uh, with the, with a case study. Um, there, there are elements of this that are true and then I've changed it to um, sort of uh, make sure that uh, I have de-identified the case sufficiently. So um, an 80-year-old female um, comes into hospital for um, knee joint replacement, um, past medical history of hypertension, diabetes, um, high cholesterol, um, osteoarthritis. Um, current medications include paracetamol, an ACE inhibitor, metformin, desuvastatin, isomeprazole, and multivitamin. Comes in, um, oh, she also has um, severe uh, osteoarthritis of her knee, is on paracetamol, uh, was on pregabalin, but um, she stopped it before she came to hospital um, because of the side effects, and um, don't like to take non steroidal anti inflammatories. Um, and I knew there would be a mistake on my slides, and here we go. Um, <laughs> there's always a mistake on my slides um, because of the gastric history. Um, intraoperatively, uh, received a nerve block, um, paracetamol, oxycodone, commenced on some targin um, on the day of surgery um, in conjunction with some paracetamol endone as well. Um, the acute pain services reviewed and stopped the targin and reviewed the block. The patient then went on to uh, develop cellulitis of the other leg um, because of that started uh, some antibiotics, had to recommence the targin that got stopped to help mobilise, the dose was changed a couple of times um, and then also received a couple of other opioids as well but none of them were prescribed on discharge. Um, discharge medications did include some targin and some breakthrough endone and um, we presented to ED nine months later for abdominal pain um, to find that the patient was still receiving Targin from that previous admission. And um, we could spend the rest of the hour sort of stepping through this and working out where and if and what information we need to make better judgments or whether in fact this was appropriate management for this patient. So I, I want you to keep an open mind. There are lots of red flags that jump out when you look at this in isolation, but we don't have a lot of the other details of what happened in the community, how many times the patient was reviewed uh, by their GP, was the targin still for the osteoarthritis, well, was it for something else, etc., etc. And that's not an uncommon scenario. So I guess when I think about tackling um, the problem that is around opioids, I always want to look at it in a different way. I, I've got a very much a mindset of how can we prevent rather than react. That, that's just in my DNA, that's how I think about things. So for me, the problems, there are lots of problems with opioids and when I talk about opioids, I mean prescription opioids. 
And it's about finding the balance between pain management and then avoiding the unintended harm. And for me, that has to be the central premise because that's the patient-centered approach to uh, pain management and also really about how we can tackle this problem with opioids. So I guess um, I love data. Um, and uh, one of the, the questions I always ask is, so is there a problem? Is there a problem in the US, in Canada, in the UK? I don't actually live in any of those environments. So that's interesting, whatever problems they might have. But because I live and work in Australia and particularly in Queensland, I really want to know what is the problem in an Australian setting and particularly what are some of the issues in Queensland. And when we started, we actually went even narrower and went, what is a problem in, my, in our own emergency department? So um, this is a photo that was shared by one of my colleagues. And this is not an unfamiliar um, uh, situation where patients usually bring the family, uh, sorry, the, the family of the patients who have recently passed away might bring all their medications to return for safe disposal. Um, the list of the drugs on the side is what we could have identified. We don't even have the quantities of that from this photograph. But I guess the take home message for me is this is a representative of that reservoir that is in someone's cupboard or some, a box somewhere. What happens to those people, to those drugs that don't get returned to pharmacy for disposal? And, and then there's a lot of this type of um, scenario happening in our own medicines cupboards as well. We get prescriptions that we don't necessarily complete, what happens there. Um, with opioids, a particular risk is if it got prescribed for a, um, an agreed, or, or a, uh, not an agreed, sorry, a appropriate indication, and if we give a quantity that is more than what that patient might need, they might keep that and they might then have it self Medicaid, or they might actually share it. And a lot of, I, I hear a lot of stories where people go, oh yeah, I gave one to the neighbor because they had a headache because it helped when I had surgery. Um, this is a really good publication that came out last year and I highly encourage if you're interested in this space to have a look at it. It's a study that the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare undertook in conjunction with Canada. Um, we have similar health systems, we have similar pa uh, patient populations and it compared the Australian um, story essentially for the last decade around opioid prescribing and unintended harms associated with prescription opioids particularly, and really nutted down in detail. Um, there's a lot of highlights in that uh, publication, but for me, I guess the couple of things that stood out was that there are 150 hospitalizations, 14 ED presentations, and three deaths per day across the country that was attributed to prescription opioids in 2017. So the reason I'm putting a lot of context to that that was in 2017. I don't know what that statistic is now. Um, and then in that same year, prescription opioids contributed to more opioid related admissions than heroin in Australia. So that's a little bit of the harm. And there was uh, the more recent Pennington report. There's a lot of media attention on prescription opioid related harms. So I won't really spend a lot of time going into that. But I wanted to know what about utilisation? Like, are we prescribing more as well? Um, our population has been fairly stable for the last um, few decades. So it's, it's, it's correct to say, I, I think there has been an increase in prescription opioids. So if you look at the, the Australian map, now that the dates are between 1992 and 2009, um, and that uses PBS data. And um, I, think the PBS underestimates potentially by about 10% um, because not every prescription in that time period were captured through the PBS. Um, so there was a 15-fold increase over that 20-year period across the country and that was largely attributed to um, oxycodone coming onto the PBS. And um, the Queensland data, um, I'm sure that you're all um, familiar with the MODS database. And um, the, over the last 10 years, 
and there's been a threefold increase um, in, in, the, in our local data set. Um, what the Queensland data set doesn't capture because it captures all the d uh, prescriptions that are dispensed in the community, it doesn't capture what happens in a hospital setting. Well, actually, neither of the data sets do. Um, and, it, and, and be it private or public hospital setting. Uh, the Queen, other than that, the Queensland data set is fairly uh, representative of the dispensing of opioids. So people also get prescribed but never actually get them dispensed as well. Um, this is looking at that 10-year um, period or, or nine-year period uh, in this graph um, and looking at what's a split between the different agents. Um, and I've got lots of other graphs, but I won't, I won't keep going on about them. But this one particularly, I think, highlights um, that blue line is all oxycodone preparations. And we haven't replaced that. We haven't replaced another drug with oxycodone. We've just added that on to our sort of toolbox in, in addressing pain. So uh, one of my colleagues actually pointed out, if you, if you sort of um, draw backwards in time of that graph, you'll see when it got the PBS listing. So unless before that we were leaving a lot of people in pain, what we're doing with oxycodone is really, is, is, you know, it, it merits thinking about what we're doing with that drug. And um, all the others have sort of consistently stayed the same. So how did we get here? Um, it, it, it's been a long, long uh, part. So in late, early, sorry, early um, 1980s, there was some publications that said Essentially, if um, you prescribe opioids um, for chronic pain, then addiction was low. And then this one particular publication that I've given an example here has actually been, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it's actually been cited 608 times. And others have actually gone and done studies on the impact of this particular publication. And so that's that graph um, on, the, on the other side. And you can see that there was a spike around 1996, um, sort of mid-90s, and that's when oxycodone came onto the market, um, of people saying that this was in fact true and, and publishing data on the back of that. Um, there's a great ABC Conversations podcast called Taking the Pulse of a Dope Sick Nation, if you want to hear a lot more detail about what happened in that time in America. Um, but just to sort of summarise, um, you know, pain w uh, was um, described as the fifth vital sign. It was actually, there was a WHO statement around that it's a human right not to be in pain. And um, opioids, you know, like I was a clinical pharmacist pre pre uh, late 90s and um, they were reserved for severe pain. I remember a time when we used to be a lot more careful and considerate. Um, when we prescribed opioids, um, and, and there's been aggressive industry marketing as well. So I guess um, we have a problem, we all accept that there's a problem. Um, it's taken us some time to get to this point, but what are some of the factors that we need to keep mindful of if we were to balance providing patients with good analgesia and avoiding unintended harm? Sorry got ahead of myself. So um, one of the things is that uh, we are in a complex adaptive system. Um, so the perfect understanding of an individual part doesn't automatically convey the perfect understanding of the entire system. So um, by which I mean that well-intentioned interventions that we put in place could actually have both positive and negative unintended consequences. And um, we live in this bottom um, uh, pictures of pretty chaotic worlds of uh, hospitals or, you know, like if you think about that traffic uh, jam there, imagine what would happen if we thought, oh, what we need is some traffic lights or a roundabout to fix that problem. We might actually fix it in that setting, but we might end up creating a lot more havoc elsewhere on, on that stretch of road. Um, so I don't want to keep going on too much about it, but it, it's to say 
when we do want to develop interventions to address this problem of opioids, we have to be careful and mindful of what we are doing and also anticipate some of that unintended consequences as well. Um, this is uh, another slide and uh, that I've got around implementation science. So um, it t it, people say on average it takes two to four years for um, translating research into practice, but there's also actually evidence that to change the way, um, like to get sustainable change that could actually at be as long as 12 years. Um, and some of the, the things that we need to be mindful is, you know, in a, in a clinical setting, competing demands of your frontline clinicians, lack of knowledge and not necessarily the type of knowledge we think they might be lacking. So need to find out what that knowledge is. Skills and resources, misalignment of evidence with operational priorities, etc. The reason I've got four pictures there of cakes is not because I like cake, I do. Um, it's, it's more to really um, draw your attention that they are all cake, um, potentially made of the same uh, ingredients, but maybe not. We don't quite know that. Uh, they would, you would think, cost differently, would be used in different settings. And what I want to highlight there is no two similar, no two clinical settings, hospitals or environments are similar. So what might work at, say, the Prince Charles in their emergency department, in its entirety, in its cookie cutter form, may or may not work at the Royal, at Caboolture or Redcliffe, because we are all different settings. And um, and what might work in an emergency department setting may not work in a surgical setting of the same facility, just to appreciate those differences. Um, so opioid stewardship, what is it? What is stewardship? Um, if you look up the, in the dictionary, stewardship is, the definition of stewardship is taking care of something. Um, there, this particular definition I got out of uh, the Canadian Opioid Stewardship Program and it basically says to coordinate interventions that are designed to improve, monitor, evaluate use of opioids in pain management. But what is that? Um, this is my definition of that in a clinical setting in an acute facility. So this may not be the same definition that you might come up with if we were looking at the ambulance services or uh, the prison systems or even general practice. It may be, or maybe we might need to change things. So for me, the, the key is that patient. So facilitating quality improvement of overall pain management, um, that it's a coordinated approach and that there's interdisciplinary buy-in to it. It's not one group or one process solely or, or a team solely responsible for ensuring that we all do the right thing. Um, that it's multi-pronged intervention. So we're not relying on a single thing that's going to work, but it's multiple things that we are utilising um, with a common goal. That it's context sensitive, so I talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, it's underpinned by rational prescribing, and it's a partnership between the organisation, the patient and the community. So all those things, to me, um, are key elements of an opioid stewardship programme, but I don't necessarily think that I have identified them all. So if you have any suggestions um, for me to consider inclu inclusion to this diagram, please let me know. I just want to sort of step through each of it and just sort of give you a reasoning behind it as well. Um, so promoting pay management um, is a priority and, and providing the resources and education and support and, um, for pain management is also equally important. And so we want to make sure that goal of reducing opioid prescribing doesn't com compromise the care and com comfort of our patients. So that, that's very important. And um, why is building a multidisciplinary team important? So to make sure the early successes is then sustained within that department. There's that and um, it's appropriately designed for that department's needs and resourcing and it's also owned by the people in those clinical settings as opposed to an external uh, uh, body or entity. 
Um, to ensure the best chance for sustainability, we'd really have to use that multi-pronged approach. And so no two teams are all departments or facilities are the same, as I mentioned, and so we really have to make sure whatever interventions that have demonstrated good outcomes in one setting is, is take scale to uh, or, and spread to other settings, but be mindful and co-designing it to um, develop appropriate interventions. And then promoting an approach to opioid and, and analgesia prescribing which takes into account that individual needs of the patient rather than providing generic quantities of tablets that are usually full boxes or PBS quantities or, you know, this is the easy thing to do or default to do. Um, and pr by promoting education and consumers, um, education of consumers and partnerships with general practitioners, we can really improve um, that provision of care through the continuum. So when the patient comes into a, a facility and we prescribe them with opioids as a part of you know, all the other things that we are also using to provide analgesia, that good c clear communication on discharge, if the patient goes back to their GP for getting ongoing care, the GP understands what the plan was, the patient understands, and then they make a um, a plan for going into the future. I just want to um, also really acknowledge that what I'm going to about to describe as the program is really aimed at the middle group, um, if you like, of standard patients. So it's not aimed at top of the pyramid of our complex patients and um, who we define as frail um, or on high dose opioids or opioid treatment programs. Um, or a, in, in persistent pain um, type scenarios because they are complex situations. This is a very much a how can we optimise care in acute settings for patients who are predominantly don't nor, um, take regular opioids. So if I was to go in to hospital, I haven't taken... And we define opioid naivety as not on a prescription opioid in the last 60 days. So if I fell off my bike, went into ED um, with some fractured ribs, if they prescribe me some opioids, um, because fractured ribs are very, very painful, then it's about making sure that not only my pain's managed, but I also don't end up in a sort of a persistent pain situation or have leftover opioids that I take then later on for a migraine a few months later or uh, something else. So making sure our patients stay within that middle group or come down to not requiring opioids and their patient pain's well-managed group. Um, why did we start this process? So back in um, 2016, um, we did a snapshot audit of our emergency department and found that about 5%, so roughly we have about 7,000 ED presentations uh, are discharged from ED with the oxycodone prescription for 20. Uh, 20 is, endone 20 uh, tablets is the PBS quantity, so that's a default. Of that entire statistic, the bit that stands out to me personally is that it seems that everyone needed 20, so are we all identical, is the bit that stands out, not necessarily the 5%. Um, and subsequently, when, I, when we've done this project elsewhere in other hospitals, um, the, the prescribing is around 45 to 5%, and I think that that in itself kind of gives you a bit of comfort that that's probably an appropriate number because pain is, 60% of our ED presentations have a pain element to it. Um, so what can we do about that? Do we go, okay, everyone's getting a box of 20, the easiest way to decrease that is give everyone a strip of 10? Or do we go uh, maybe make five the magic number? Or do we take the focus away from that and go let's focus on why we are prescribing opioids. So one, the, we have three goals and our first goal was to get um, us to individualise care. So treating the underlying causes of pain, recognising treating, talking to the patient and setting expectations of pain management. 
Um, one of the things that I'm constantly fascinated by is, even I do this, I talk about pain as a, as a singular thing, but it's actually lots of different um, contexts of pain and the way you manage those different contexts vary as well, even within the same person. So the way you might manage my migraine might be different to when I come in with a rib fracture or I have post-operative pain, but we talk about pain as a singular thing. And our experience of pain, this really high interpatient variability, intersubject variability as well. And so by having a conversation with patients, we can sort of start setting that expectation of how we might manage that pain. I think uh, from a consumer point of view, there might be an expectation of being in no pain. There is a difference between being in no pain and also being comfortable and managing the pain and having a good function and then using, in that space, using prescription opioids to do that versus being in zero pain is the target. Um, Utilising things like simple analgesia, so that's your paracetamol, your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. People don't often take them regularly, don't actually know that you can take them regularly. And there's um, not a lot of buy-in for their analgesic properties because I think you can buy it in the supermarket. So it's, it's you know, would they work? Absolutely. Um, regular paracetamol, actually uh, one study showed that decreases your um, opioid requirements by up to 30%. So it's, it's worth definitely pursuing that uh, path. Then the other thing is also utilizing non-pharmacological means of pain management. You know, ice packs, heat packs, um, physio, and the list goes on. Um, and that, that needs to come into our conversation when we're talking about pain management rather than simply defaulting to that prescription. Um, and we need to partner the patient with that pain management um, plan. Otherwise, it's very difficult to have a successful pain management plan. Um, so if opioids are one of the tools that you're going to go to in that toolbox and using multiple tools for uh, managing pain, then I think we should give careful consideration to quantity. Actually, think in a, this is in a more a primary care setting, is the patient known to you? Um, because how you might manage that might differ from patient to patient. And then is there a clear indication for using opioids? So that's goal one. Goal two is around improving clinical handover. So from hospitals and having, when we do decide to prescribe an opioid, having a clear de-escalation plan to our community, primary care, um, health providers to our GPs is really useful. So if we think about our patient at the beginning of the um, a presentation, if there was a clear plan that this targeting was temporary um, and please don't continue unless you think that there's another specific indication for it, that's one scenario versus the assumption that the targeting is an ongoing management for pain. Um, and that this is um, something that we're working very hard on is improving the clinical handover. And the third thing is patient education and on both pain and in this case because our target is um, endone or oxycodone and um, around how to take oxycodone in conjunction with your simple analgesia and when to take it in terms of your pain. So um, how do we do it? Um, what we did was we designed uh, these projects. They're called um, Optimizing Opioid Prescribing Projects. Uh, oops, uh, it, was, it was not my choice, um, that, that uh, acronym, but a, one of the junior doctors who work with me came up with it, and in spirit of co-design, I've, I've left it. Um, sorry. Um, so what it is, is that we want to get those three goals into clinical practice. And the people that we are hoping to influence to change the way they um, do day-to-day -day business are prescribers at this point. And so every project is led by a prescriber in that clinical um, rotation. So um, I call them the person who's most likely to prescribe at the point of discharge is the project lead. Um, then 
there is a, a senior medical officer in those in that context who also supervises and um, mentors um, the, the project lead, and then a team of pharmacies, nursing, acute pain services, etc., cetera, um, physio, um, who, who sort of largely support it um, in terms of like departmental engagement, et cetera. So the person who's doing the project, they actually own the project, and the time frame is um, based on their rotation. So in an emergency department, this project, if a registrar is doing it, will go over six months or a year. In a surgical setting, uh, if one of the JHOs are doing it, we'll do it in 12 weeks. Um, what we do is we look at um, baseline. So what does their practice look like uh, at the beginning of the rotation? And then, um, we help co-design the education session which the project person as well as someone that has a perception of seniority and authority in that setting delivers. So in a surgical setting that might be an acute pain service doctor um, as well as a JHO talking to all the JHOs and pharmacists in that um, time. In an emergency department it might be um, the registrar plus one of the SMOs doing that education. Um, so what we want to do is promoting a tailored quantity on discharge and not default um, to 20 tablets. And in an emergency setting, we've actually um, got agreement with most of the emergency departments that we, if it's appropriate to send the patient on endone, then we will prescribe 10 or less the number of doses the patient needs on discharge. Anyone can prescribe that. But if you want to prescribe more than 10, we need to get SMO approval. And um, it's, it's only a guideline, it's, it's nowhere to enforce it. I'm not sure whether you've been in busy emergency departments, but it actually, I'll go through this um, data in a little bit, it actually works because of the way we engage and educate and, and set that the reason for us doing it isn't um, sort of uh, some punitive way or it, it's not thought through, this is actually what's good for our patients. So I'll, I'll go through the data, is there a pointer? Um, so if you look at, oh perfect, thank you, thank you. Uh, so if you look at, um, so this is from RBH, this is the original study we did, and this was a registrar, Rena Savage's um, um, registrar project, and this, these two, the time period here is a year, and we used the MODS database to do this particular analysis, and what we found in our baseline group was that only about a third of our patient had that tailored approach to prescribing, i.e. didn't get a default quantity of 20. And then after we um, the education and the, um, so we give all the, the prescribing data as, as part of that education as well, like this is your prescribing data, this is not someone else's, um, it rose to 85% at the end of that year. Now this grey is two years later, beginning of this year in February, because I've been working on this project elsewhere, um, I thought it'd be good to take a snapshot audit of our emergency department. So this is only two week representation and it's, um, it's just a quick um, collection of discharge scripts and see where our prescribing was and that and this was done by one of the JH, um, sorry, medical interns who was in uh, ED at the time, and um, we found that it's sustained. So the plan for beginning of the year was, if the um, if the prescribing hadn't this change hadn't sustained, then we'll reinvigorate the program and we'll start from there. If it had, then we'll build on it. And um, Kabulcha started around here, uh, no, a little bit later than here, but they actually started at a better baseline than us because um, we started measuring the data later, if that makes sense. And um, so they had already started to change their practice before um, we actually measured the data. And even with that, they still demonstrated that they, they could improve. Um, Redcliffe and Prince Charles have just completed this um, project um, sort of in August this year, and again, um, they've shown similar changes to practice. So um, it, in terms of the, the quantities or any of this, 
it, it's more the processes and the fact the guidelines and the um, the premises that we need to pay attention to rather than um, thinking that 10 is a magic number. I keep going on about it because there's a lot of um, coverage on that at the moment. And then in a surgical setting, the focus is a little different. Um, what we want to do is we want to make sure communication is, is there in the discharge summaries. And we want to look at if we did these cycles, would the average number um, of endone on discharge is there a change? So the actual number itself doesn't really matter. I just want to know whether there is a change. So when I look at the data set, I want to see a variance between some patients getting one, some getting 20, and all the numbers in between. If I see that everyone's getting 10, then we're not individualizing care. We're seeing everyone's getting five, we're not as well. Sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. So um, the Queensland Opioid Stewardship Program has only been in place uh, since July this year and um, that's the sponsored part of the initiative um, but before that there was a Senate meeting um, in July last year and since then a lot of different um, clinicians have contacted me and said hey can you help us do a similar initiative in our own clinical setting um, and so it's been very much a pu um, pull process rather than a push process and because of that, I've got this data now, even though the funded portion's only been for two months. Um, we have 15 sites across nine HHSs, five different clinical settings, um, and 22 cycles of OOPS being initiated, which means that we have 22 SMO leads, we have that many registrars and JHOs. So, and everyone essentially other than myself since July, have been, this is all discretionary work. We're all doing this as a part of our clinical work to improve practice. And um, at the moment, there are 11 sites across the state um, doing this project to different, um, they're at different, sta um, different states of the project, if you know what I mean. Um, and six sites have done multiple settings as well. Um, some sites have gone on to develop analgesia steering groups or analgesia guidelines, grand round presentations, etc. So they're all indicators that opioid stewardship is happening in, in those settings. And this is just uh, to tell you in your local uh, area who might be doing it and, and, and different clinical areas as well. So what are we going to do after we do a uh, couple of the OOP cycles or do we keep doing lots and lots of them till we get really sick of doing them? Um, I think once you've done one or two, it, you're in a more mature state to be able to look and say, okay, so oxycodone, we've looked at how we're prescribing it. We have done some education and um, we've seen positive outcome and engagement and the conversations are happening. The next thing to do is when you're looking at one drug you always see all the other things that are going that you can optimize as well and so it's to start going okay that's this is what's happening in discharge po point of discharge do we look at another drug or another process at the point of discharge or do we start stepping back and go um is there other opportunity for optimization in the inpatient setting um me personally i would like to get more involved with consumer engagement and starting to change that sort of um, culture and expectations of our pain management from a consumer angle. And for that, um, I've been working with Choosing Wisely Australia and NPS Medicine Wise to come up with some consumer engagement uh, material. Um, I also want to see a sustainable programs that are embedded, that are part of business as usual in different clinical settings as opposed to a single person or teams that take responsibility because I think the responsibility in addressing this problem belongs to all of us. And um, I'm hoping that I'm giving clinicians a, um, you know, how would you, what would you do tomorrow or what would you, how would you treat the next person, patient you see um, differently approach to get to get us started and as we mature we can keep tackling sort of more complex issues in our clinical settings and um, that's all I had planned um, 
there are any questions? Uh, thank you, Chems, for a very informative presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was uh, quite an eye opener to see the, uh, the what's happened with the, the rate of hospitalizations and the overdose rate and that slide that showed that single patient's collection of medication. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. Uh, quite stunning to see, but yeah. the need for stewardship is uh, badly needed, so it's yeah. great to see the outcomes that are happening there. Um, anyone here like to go to ask some questions? Uh, thanks for a really informative um, seminar. I was just wondering, um, is there any plans to send this out to some of the smaller hospitals, um, like sort of more rural and remote um, ones? Yeah, um, so that question's been asked a number of times. The way it works currently is that I take what's worked in local settings and now multiple local settings to the new facility. So for example, Gold Coast just came on board recently and the first thing they did was they said, can you come down and talk to us? And so I do a, a similar approach to this. And then after the presentation, they usually tell me some of their um, local um, resourcing or local practices or, or constraints or enables. And then we work, I help them tailor this so that they can do it and we achieve um, outcomes that are relevant to Gold Coast. The problem for me is I've not actually been to a rural setting. So whilst there's definitely the need for it and um, there's plans for it, hopefully in the future, it's about um, sort of doing, you know, staying within the areas that are familiar, if that makes sense. And also the, the patient groups are very different and I want to be respectful of that as well. Any other questions? Do we have any online? Right. So, is the opioid prescribing toolkit available on Quest? Um, no, but it's available online, uh, on on the internet, through the. Um, I think I believe you can Google it, and it's available. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Beth. Uh, no more questions. So, I'd um, like to ask everybody to. Thank you. Uh, Chance for a great presentation. Thank you.